I'm going to talk about computational design uh, specifically. Um, I'm an architect, but I have a background also in um, computer science and mathematics. I actually took um, a PhD in, in mathematics before I started um, on my architecture career. Uh, and computational design is, of course, very connected to the like state of the art in architecture. It's uh, um, always an innovative touch on, on when we're working with that. Uh, and also many parts of computational design is uh, bridging to sustainability. Um, some of the projects I'm gonna talk about is more of the, uh, more connected to sustainability and some, are, some of the projects are more just form uh, or shape. Uh, so, um, yeah, you'll see there is quite a mix of, of things. And I'm, I'm going to start talking about what I did uh, when I was in London at Foster & Partners, um, a big architecture firm uh, in Battersea. Um, and they are, they've been very um, instrumental in, in uh, getting computational design into architecture. The Gherkin was actually, uh, or actually the first project, which I'm gonna show a bit also, uh, that um, Foster and Partners did in uh, um, computational design was the British Museum, uh, the roof of the courtyard of the British Museum. And then uh, the Gherkin was also one of the first ones. But that was long before my time, at the time. That was around 2000, and I started at 2013. Uh, this was uh, one of the first projects I did uh, at Foster's, um, and that was a very rewarding project because I, I got to design this, the shape of, of these uh, quite um, freeform uh, walls and. And the thing about this was that uh, uh, we could actually, I designed, the, the, designed this with uh, parametric tools so we could actually uh, change the, the, the major form of, of these walls quite late and, and uh, uh, the program just uh, uh, regenerated uh, uh, new walls. And if I press the button, it just generated the, uh, the CAM files that is the CAD files for the, the manufacturing of the, um, uh, what's it called? Um, yeah, the forms which you, you make the uh, panels in. So it was a very uh, automatic process. When, when the design um, was done, I could, very quickly just press a button and send send the drawings directly to the uh, to the factory and and the panels were made um, and now it's actually the visitor center in uh, in Masta in a city in uh, uh, the UAE uh, this is more connected to sustainability in some sense uh, or actually or at least environmental uh, considerations because we uh, made this um, internal uh, garden in uh, for uh, an extension to the Doha International Airport and here it was all about trying to make a roof that was uh, getting enough light down to having this really lush garden uh, in the middle of this airport extension uh, but at the same time not uh, getting too much heat gain. So the design was really directly controlled by um, the environmental analysis that we did. Uh, so we made a program that um, took the analysis, took the uh, data from the environmental analysis and just uh, shaped the holes in these layers of the, of the roof. You see the roof up here, and these are the, the like shapes that it suggested. 
So lo larger uh, holes, like where where we actually needed to get the sun down. Uh, so a very very complex computational design uh, approach. Uh, this was uh, an extension to the Prado Museum in in Madrid. Um, maybe a, a bit simpler in uh, in its computational design. Um, uh, quite, I, I worked on this roof, which was quite um, regular in some sense, but also on a facade that was supposed to uh, be quite invisible. So it has like curved glass, which makes it um, when you're looking at this curved glass, you don't see see the glass because uh, the light is reflected in a way that uh, you don't. Yeah. It, it, the glass becomes uh, invisible. Uh, uh, so, but it, we actually didn't do that facade in the end, but uh, it was still an interesting uh, exercise. Um, here are two other projects. I, I won't go into any details here, but um, an interesting cladding um, exercise for um, uh, this was uh, a theater in a um, skyscraper in Philadelphia. And uh, a roof on Lucille Stadium, which is uh, going to be the opening stadium for the Qatar um, championships in, in football, soccer. Um, and this was an, uh, a roof that's opening and closing and actually also was designed uh, directly after the um, the analysis to um, the the task was to get enough light down to the um, the turf uh, to make it possible to for the grass to grow there, but still shield uh, all the audience from the from the heat from the direct sunlight. And I was also working a lot with the uh, quality of view analysis, and that's. And that means that uh, we want, from a, an apartment building especially, we want uh, nice views. So if you're living in London and um, living in a, a higher building there, uh, maybe you want to see some of the landmarks in London. And this was actually for the um, Battersea power station um, refurbishment or, or the re rebuilding of Battersea Power Station. And so I did an analysis from, from Battersea Power Station and looked at how much can we see of um, at the Houses of Parliament or London Eye or the Gurking, I think maybe it's up there. Um, I was actually up there also. Uh, I got to go up to the roof and uh, have a look out and see how well the analysis actually it fitted with my calculation. This was one of the uh, biggest projects I did uh, at Foster's, and unfortunately, the, um, it was stopped in the middle of construction, which is really sad because there was lots and lots of money like um, uh, digged into it already at that point. It's um, the planned new um, airport for Mexico City, and it, it was a, a very complex. Uh, computational design um, task. And uh, I, I took, I have some more slides on this because I think that it's, it's there's a really nice connection to, to London also uh, here because as I said before, the, the first computational design project that Foster's did was, was this roof of uh, the courtyard of the British Museum. And Chris Williams, who did this, was uh, actually finding a, a formula uh, for this roof, uh, an exact mathematical formula that uh, describes the whole roof in, in one single analytical formula. Uh, and it gives this really nice curvature and very structurally um, efficient roof also. And here we have the British Museum in London. and. What we did was doing an, a structure which was 
very, very much larger than the British Museum, but um, kind of designed in the same way. So the airport that we were doing was this size. I was really, I was really surprised when I saw this when we put the um, the size of the airport on onto London because it's actually was almost going from uh, the Thames up to Regent's Park. Uh, but uh, that was the size of, of um, what we were doing. And uh, this is the, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have better illustrations of this roof later, but this is, um, this is a, like half of the roof here that you're seeing. And uh, this enormous structure, which is uh, about 1.6 kilometers from uh, one end to the other. Um, what I think is interesting for, for this talk uh, about uh, showing this project is that this, um, this roof is really a machine in some sense that, that's working. It works very well with the environment. It's, it's uh, looking at um, the solar, um, uh, yeah, the, reducing the heat gain from the sun uh, in the way the, all the panels are um, positioned and also like how which, uh, which panels are transparent or not, of course. Uh, we have these funnels, you see all these blue um, curves going down. That's um, actually uh, the structure of the roof, which you're gonna, you're gonna see later also. Uh, but it also takes all the rain. Um, it's uh, rainwater conveyance also in those, and it also take its um, air intakes, uh, which we're going to see in the next uh, slide. So it's very much designed to be a very functional uh, shell um, and work with the environment. Uh, this is one of the funnels, and so you see here the, the structure going down and actually supporting the whole roof, but also um, how the air intake works and just it takes air in through, through the funnels and then um, distributing it through the building. So this is the whole roof here, and you can imagine that when you have a big team designing a, an airport like this and you're going to do a shell which covers it all, then you need, need a model that's really adaptive. And uh, we, we needed something that if there's a design change in somewhere in the interior, we need the shell to adapt to that. So uh, it would be impossible to do this manually. So we had to use our computational design techniques to, to make an algorithm a very complex algorithm that uh, where we could generate this shell um, according to some constraints we're setting. Um, and it's also, yeah, here is a, uh, one of the challenges of this. It, it's actually getting a tr nice triangulation of this whole, whole shell. So every time we change the shape, we need to recalculate how the um, triangulation works here. Uh, the whole shell is also uh, very structurally efficient. So, and um, uh, the point of this is is that we're having um, uh, we're gonna we want to minimize the, the amount of material we're using, and uh, the way we do this is that we're using uh, the hang, hanging chain idea. This was uh, something that Robert Hooke in 1675 to um, propose the first time, but Gaudi used that a lot, um, especially in the La Sagrada Familia in um, Barcelona. So this is models we to see if you're uh, visiting the La Sagrada Familia. Uh, we did a big hanging chain model of, of this whole roof. Uh, so th this was mostly to, to show the idea of the whole roof, that it's actually, um, we made this change and then turned it all upside down. So this model is actually a physical model that uh, we had in, um, in the studio in Foster's. 
Uh, but the way you're doing this in, in practice is that we actually, we have a big um, 3D model where we, let's see if I can show this once again. Um, no, let's see. Um, where we're actually doing this so-called relaxation. You could think of that we have this shape and then we let it hang. Um, so if we look at this upside down, we, we just let it loose and it finds its shape by itself. And this shape that it's finding then is, is the most structurally optimal. Uh, this is a detail which I work on quite quite a lot. Um, uh, the gates or or, or so-called fixed links bridges for for all the airplanes. Uh, this uh, it looks like a detail, but at the same time it was uh, a big task to get um, all these fixed links bridges uh, automatically. Um, uh, that the geometry of those automatically fit to the whole shape um, of the building. So we see here that we, let's see, yeah, we put this bridges in and yeah, it, it's automatically uh, fits, find, finds the triangulations for uh, every one of those. And that it seems maybe more trivial than than it is because uh, at every meeting here, every every join of uh, fixed link bridge to the overall shape, there's a new condition, so it needs to be totally adapted. And this is how it looks when it's detailed properly. Uh, this is uh, from a funnel from above, uh, just showing the idea about the, the lighting in the, uh, in the roof. Uh, and as I said, if we're looking at this environmentally and uh, from a sustainability view, then uh, the idea here is to actually minimize the amount of steel we're using, the amount of material. And uh, a fun fact here with this one is that actually the shell, um, the structure that I've been sh showing, is only 5% of the weight uh, of the whole airport. So actually the, um, the concrete, uh, what's it called, um, foundation of the whole building, that's, that's the blue in this uh, um, diagram there. And you see the difference between that and, and, the, and the shell. So the next step here would be, how can we actually minimize the amount of concrete in the foundation? So this was uh, how it was planned, the airport. Unfortunately, um, the building was stopped when uh, the, the con construction was stopped when um, when the funnels were built. So now it's only like the the foundation and these these funnels sticking up like mushrooms uh, from the foundation. Um, I think it's really unfortunate that it they went so far and then uh, there was a new government in Mexico and it was stopped. Um, but it was a, a still an, an interesting exercise and a very like, yeah, we learned a lot from doing this. It's a bit, uh, <laughs> So this tidy uh, airport never is, so <laughs> it wouldn't be this tidy, but it would. I think it would still be a very nice uh, structure. This. So you will see now that the scales uh, of these projects, th this was the ones that were done, done in, at Foster's. Now I'm gonna jump over to uh, the Swedish, um, architecture scene and you will see see a drastic difference because uh, um, unfortunately we're not doing uh, these multi-billion billion projects in the same way but um, but you can still find uh, <clears throat> very interesting challenges uh, the 
as you saw in this first progress, it's it was a lot about shape and form and big structures and, and very freeform structures. Um, if you're looking at the Swedish market, we don't really have so many of those projects, but at, as a computational designer, you, you, you instead work mostly on, um, on the analysis side, like uh, finding ways of um, taking in as much data as possible in the construction um, or in, in the design and construction of the buildings. And, um, and and making them as environmentally uh, well performing as possible. Uh, this is FOIA. Uh, uh, it's actually one of the biggest um, architecture firms in Sweden, and definitely the biggest in uh, in southern Sweden. Uh, and we are doing uh, quite ordinary projects, uh, but. Uh, um, yeah, bigger bigger projects for uh, for the Swedish market, but uh, um, not not that much internet or um, not any international uh, projects uh, this far at least. But a lot of different uh, programs, uh, everything from um, I see. Actually, it says this is in Swedish. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't changed this, but it, it, it's a mix of different programs. Everything from city planning to offices and, and landscaping. I took this uh, in also because actually um, I'm I work as a computational designer, but I'm also an, an ordinary architect, and this was uh, what I was working on now. Uh, the latest thing I uh, accomplished it's uh, uh, a new project in in Lund. Um, quite classic uh, uh, um, what's it called um, residential building um, anyway um, but I'm going to focus on uh, FOIA code which is uh, our computational design uh, group at FOIA uh, and uh, we're mixing then architecture, mathematics, and coding, just as I did at, at Foster's. Um, we have three three legs that we're we're looking at, and as I said before, it's quite quite a lot on the simulation and analysis side, looking at how can we use uh, environmental analysis and data to make as well performing buildings as possible. Um, but we're also looking at parametric design, which was um, the ma main thing I was looking at at Foster's, that is doing um, uh, shaping buildings, uh, the actual shape of them uh, being what we call, call a smart geometry, that it, it's actually functional in some way. It's, it's uh, well performing when it's come to its structural, structural capabilities, for example. Uh, but the third leg, which I didn't do that much at Foster's, that's um, digital fabrication. That's um, quite a visionary uh, part of it because that's looking at how how will we build buildings in the future? Um, will we, for example, use robotics uh, more than we're doing today? The, uh, the building sector is still very um, still very much uh, traditional manual work. And uh, uh, if you're looking at, if you're comparing the building sector, for example, to car manufacturing, that there's, uh, has been, in car manufacturing, there has been a, a very, I mean, been, been very roboticized or what you call it. Uh, and, um, the the manual workers are mostly like supervising, but in uh, building it's still uh, very much not so. But we're looking at from as architects, we're looking at what would uh, robots actually. We're not that much interested in in the automation part of it, but more like what what can we gain 
when it comes to design. Um, how can we can we build things that we can't build today? Can we build them? Uh, can we build more interesting shapes and forms, uh, but uh, with the same econ economy that we're building, like straight walls today? Uh, so I, I will. We're working on a research uh, project together with the Lund Institute of Technology on this one, and I'll show something uh, on that. Um, but the first project I will show is what we call the volume analysis. And that's about um, knowing, knowing as much as possible at an early stage in the design, because the design decisions that you take at the early stage, that they're they are the most important. That, that, that's where you can actually uh, save something, uh, both both money, but also like uh, how how well the building performs when it comes to environmental considerations. Uh, and this is a, a program that uh, we wrote for seeing. Um, well, the the way you're supposed to work with it is that you when you're drawing. And when you're or three D modeling your your building at an early stage, you will directly get a lot of data on how well this building performs. So uh, we, for example, directly get uh, daylight um, data that that is like how how much daylight uh, reaches different parts of, of the facade, um, the views, uh, especially for residential buildings, how how Good are the views, for example, of the sea. Um, but we also look at uh, um, heat gain. How, how much is uh, how much um, what they call uh, how much do we need to shade um, the sun in the some areas? Uh, at the same time, we're also also of course looking at the, the areas like the floor areas and the facade area. Uh, we're looking at the average U value, which the U value says something about um, how well um, how well the the building performs when it comes to energy, uh, and then um, also people flow. Uh, we can get into this um, simulations. So we we're doing uh, what we want to do is. Um, a tool for the designer just to be able to um, always have this support of the data, the support of the analysis, uh, only a, like a click away. So it, it will, um, um, yeah, it will, the designer will make the best decisions. What we see here in, in um, uh, here we, in the program, we actually, uh, comparing different shapes, and uh, what was down here is something called the form factor, and uh, the diagram is uh, of different heights here, and and um, the form factor says something about how big is the facade area compared to the floor area. Uh, when it comes to energy, we want the facade area to be as small as possible compared to the floor area, because then um, we um, we need less uh, to, uh, to actually warm up the building, or um, uh, it's it's more energy efficient. Uh, but often the interesting thing about working with analysis like this is that actually, uh, if we were only thinking thinking about the form factor, we we would get the building that's extremely um, it's extremely low and uh, very thick but then we come to daylight and we we can't build a building like that because um, uh, we need daylight in the building so so that we can have good workplaces over the whole floor plans so um, there's the interesting thing is when it comes to conflicting um, constraints this is a, a movie showing when we're working with this tool. And uh, 
So here is views of the sea, uh, how well, this, this is actually a site, um, this is actually the site for our offices in, in Malmö Harbor. And um, here we see the green means how much of, of green, green parks do you see? Um, and then we can switch to daylight and we see the red means very good um, daylight, but then you see in the more shadowed parts, it's not that good. Um, the interesting part comes to when we're weighing all of these analysis together. And if we're looking, I can stop it here. This is uh, when we're weighing views of the sea and parks and, and landmark buildings um, and daylight together. And then we actually see that the, the darkest green here means the, the best performance. And of course, if you live up here, you have good daylight and you also have good views of the sea. But in the middle here, that's what, what when with this weighing, it says that these are the uh, worst performing uh, here because uh, in this part, there's not, not any good views of the sea and you're, you have quite a distance. So you don't see that much directly of, of the park down here. You see the park more if you're down at this stage. So um, it actually, and that actually fits with what uh, contractors or not contractors, but uh, developers say that often these middle apartments are the, the hardest to, um, to sell, actually. Um, going even more into sustainability, uh, we've been looking a lot at uh, life cycle analysis uh, lately. That, that's something that's uh, growing a lot in, in the architecture firms. Uh, or the, yeah. So um, what we want to do here is to actually add on uh, life cycle analysis on the volume analysis that I did before. So we want at an early stage of the design to do, um, to make design decisions that reduce the carbon footprint um, as much as possible. Um, and this is a very simple uh, uh, illustration of this, that we're changing the shape of the building and then uh, how much uh, carbon dioxide equivalent per square meter uh, is changing differently in the, in the building also. It's, it's more easy in some ways to see on this one. This is an analysis that we get out of um, looking at the whole, a larger development. This is in Kofansta, I think, where we did this analysis. And here we see that um, for different, um, for different blocks here, we, we get different amounts of, of concrete, for example, in the different parts. And then you get different amounts of uh, carbon, carbon dioxide equivalents per inhabitant, which we are looking at here. And um, what, what the program does is that it suggests then that um, different ways to go. If, if we're using more wood, for example, in the construction, of course, it will be better on the CO2 equivalent. Um, but an interesting thing that we've found here also is that Actually, the higher we make the buildings, um, uh, the better it performs with respect to um, CO2 equivalents per inhabitant also, because you, you need less material um, than if you're building uh, less extra material than compared to if you're building lots of smaller uh, or lower buildings. Uh, the next tool I'm looking at here is something called city fiction, uh, which is a um, city planning and um, densification tool. Uh, the idea of this tool came up when um, we got contacted by Malmö City, and they have a, a program called 500 Malmö 500K, which means um, 
how a visionary project on like looking at how will Malmö be able to grow to host 500,000 inhabitants. Uh, right now it hosts 350,000 and but within I think it is uh, um, 2000 or in, in 2040 or 2045 um, they project that it will have uh, half a million inhabitants. So the question is here how will that how will the best and sustainable growth of, of Malmö uh, be in order to uh, host that, that many inhabitants? Um, and what we've been looking at here is what we call quality driven city planning. So we want to maximize the qualities uh, or the we want to maximize what we're valuing in a city. Um, and, um, and also just like analyze how, how is the, the qualities that we're looking at, how are they, um, um, what's it called? Um, how even are they spread uh, over the city? So it supports design decision when it comes comes to city development. Um, so the city, when I'm talking about city qualities, I can talk about things like the closeness to water uh, in in Malmö is by the by the sea. So um, maybe a lot of people want to live quite close to the sea. Um, definitely close to parks. That's a big uh, quality in a city, and also close to transportation hubs, um, at least especially if it's if it's office buildings. Um, but um, we were looking at different cities um, and uh, the density of different cities. And Malmö is very undense when you compare to uh, the biggest cities of Europe, of course. Uh, Stockholm in their cities uh, more than double as dense in London. Uh, even denser. Paris in a city is actually the densest um, in Europe, um, but 20,000 inhabitants per square kilometer is still uh, quite low compared to some of the suburbs in Paris, which are much denser than that. And then we also compare to Manhattan, uh, 28,000. Uh, this is the program, and I'm, I'm actually going to switch. Um, Let's see here. I'm gonna actually start this program, um, and I'm gonna have a live demonstration of that um, because this is Malmö land, and, and we loaded in a lot of data here. And if you see this uh, beige uh, toning in the background, that's uh, saying something about like how good how how many good qualities are there in, in this point? And, and what I mean with good qualities in this case then is uh, how close is this to the sea, parks, um, and transportation hubs. It also, here it also actually looks at how close to main arteries of transportation, but that's, that's more interesting when it comes to office buildings than, than um, uh, than residential, of course. But if I'm if I'm changing closeness to the sea here, for example, we see that it gets more uh, bright on, uh, close to the water. And if I'm changing, for example, uh, closeness to parks, we see that around the parks it gets really bright. So this is what I'm changing here: is the weighing between those. Um, qualities and and this is only an example. We can put in much more uh, different uh, qualities here. Uh, I'm gonna do a simulation now of the of the density. So if I'm I'm just gonna I can work with two different densities here, but I'm I'm working just with one for um, easiness of understanding. Um, now I'm saying that it's uh, 
1,000 new inhabitants that are, are going to be, um, we're going to find, make the developments for, for 2,000 more inhabitants. If I have this uh, as a density, um, the program suggests these areas as uh, uh, the best ones for the development. And I, this is actually quite interesting because this area here is the new harbor in um, in Malmö, it's called. And that's that's actually one of the biggest new development sites in uh, in Malmö. And if I'm now changing this, so you see, I'm change this up to ten thousand, from thousand to ten thousand. You see that the white area grows, and the white is what it's where it's suggesting new development and uh, as you remember I said um, pre from 350,000 to, to 500,000 inhabitants and that means 150,000 new and if I go now I'm only at 73,000 here and if I'm going up to 150 we're actually we've actually built on all the all the possible areas in 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 Malmö where there's any type of, of space. Uh, but that, if I'm then changing the density, so I, this is density 4,000 uh, inhabitants per square kilometer. If I'm changing this, so it goes up to nine, well, let's see, we have 9,000 there, then it's Stockholm levels. If I'm changing it to 12,000, we're in London inner city levels. Uh, if I go down to or up to 20,000, this is then Paris levels. And if I'm taking it all the way up to 28,000, it's uh, New York, Manhattan density levels. So if, you, if we're building on all the white ones here and we're going to get one, a half a million inhabitants in Malmö, then we need to build. Manhattan style in, in these areas. Um, what, what we can do with this tool also is that I can actually add objects. And you see in this one, I have um, closeness to parks, for example, as one, um, one quality. Actually, I can change, for example, uh, closeness to the sea here. And if I'm changing that, you see that it's the best areas are becoming the ones that are close to the sea, closest to the sea. Um, but if I'm, this is actually the harbor in in uh, in Malmo, and, and it's not uh, real, really realistic that this will be a residential area, at least not uh, the whole of it here. But now, I mean, this Bahamnen here was was harbor before, and that's like the prime. Uh, prime residential location right now, and uh, this Nyhamn will be that too. So it's not what this uh, uh, program is doing is it that it's it's not really caring about if um, if it's reasonable to uh, take away all the harbor areas, uh, but it, it's just saying that this is really good area for. Uh, for residential development if, if we're putting these as the qualities. Uh, but up here we see that it's, it's totally, there's no white in this area, even if it's close to the sea. But what this is lacking is closeness to, uh, to parks, because if we're clicking on this one, we see these are the big parks that we're talking about, but in the harbor, of course, there's not any big parks. Um, so what I will do now is that I will actually draw a park up in this area. And if you would do a development here, you would probably want to do uh, some recreational area here also. But I, and I will add this to the, to the parks. And it needs to calculate for a while, but then you see that actually now this area here was also considered as good development because it has a park nearby also. So this was just um, a demonstration of 
one of the programs that we have been doing, working with at Bio here. Um, so as you see, it's quite a difference between uh, what you do as a computational uh, designer in Sweden and in uh, at the bigger international firm, but there's still interesting uh, tasks, both of them. Um, I'm gonna change to presentation mode again. So I talked about the robotic masonry before, and this is, as I said, a research project with um, Lund Institute of Technology. Um, this is a movie we did of one of our first tests with um, doing robotic masonry. So I'm actually designing, I designed this wall in my 3D modeling program, but I also calculated or actually produced the steering program for the, the robot in directly in the 3D modeling program. The robot, as you see here also, there are some tags. I can uh, go back. There's some tags on the stones. And uh, what the robot is actually doing is that it's finding the stones by itself. So we don't need to put the stones uh, at a special, special location, but it finds, it sees where the stones are. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip this one. This is in Swedish also, but it's about the different stages in in a normal building project, but how it changed when it comes to robotic uh, building and stuff. Um, this is a visionary uh, movie about how it could look when robots is is building a wall, and also what kind of walls. Uh, we actually could build them. You see at uh, this wall, for example, here we have, it's quite in, let's see if I go back. Uh, um, in this area here, it's quite smooth, but then we're rotating the stones more and more the further we come along the wall here. And so that's, um, that's something that would be very hard to do uh, with a manual work because you don't you wouldn't know it would be very hard to rotate the stone just what it would be maybe 0 0.1 degrees or even less every time and so it would be enough when you come uh, out on the side um, so we would be able to do designs in this way that that's are quite impossible to do today but we're not only looking at that. If, if you're looking at this facade, this is more traditional, not, not this uh, entry uh, position, but if, if we're looking at, for example, here, this is quite traditional, but we are also looking at how to build a standard building today. Uh, what challenges are there when you're working with a robot? And this robot we're doing, working with here, this is a newly developed robot uh, from a company called Cognomotics in Lund, uh, which they are developing together with the Lund Institute of Technology. And we're especially developing this for uh, actually building, um, um, yeah, for building construction. And this is the actual robot when it's uh, building. It's going, going a bit slow now, but that's only for safety. It can, it, it can go do extremely much faster. But this design is, uh, this design of the wall here, it's done um, directly, it's done with parametric design tools and then the steering program is automatically created also from, from the 3D modeling tool. This is actually a part, we, we're actually gonna build this probably in, in, um, at the site in Lund, because there's something called Science Village in Lund, which is uh, an area where, um, yeah, a new development area in uh, in in Lund, and uh, it's going to be um, a mix of academic and um, um, what's it called of offices and. Uh, what we're going to do with this is that we're actually going to be able to build a noise reduction, uh, reduction, reducing wall 
uh, using this uh, robotic technique. So we're going to take out a robot to the site and we're going to do an event where people can come and look and have a look at, at the building. Uh, the last one I'm going to show is, is quite a, um, it's, it's a special building in Malmö. It's, it's known, uh, it's well known here. Uh, it may, might not look that much when you're looking at it here, but it actually has a quite advanced facade because it's, it's small ceramic tiles on this whole facade and it's darker tiles in the bottom and then it gets brighter and brighter, and it has a quite intricate um, pattern on this. And this is being refurbished right now, and it's actually starting to get finished. I, I should have a build um, an image on the finished building also, but I, unfortunately, I don't have it here. Uh, but my task for this one was to actually calculate calculate the pattern for uh, a new pattern. To, uh, to get the same effect of being dark in the bottom and bright above, but having as few uh, sheets of tiles as possible, a few sheets, of different sheets of tiles as possible. Uh, so making this as economic as possible um, and, and still have like uh, the sort of the effect. This is just the building, but I'm showing this because we see all the elements of the building is these. Um, for every little part like this, we did one drawing. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna show it here. This is the end result. Um, so we have one element like this, and um, uh, these are all the different sheets of tiles where, where, which we're um, putting up here. So the, the factory that were doing this uh, facade elements, they were getting these drawings and they had a, another factory, factory who made the sheets and then they, they were actually manually then uh, making these elements. And, um, but the interesting thing here was that all of these 1,700 drawings uh, of this kind was done totally automatic because I was just setting how big are the sheets, what, how many colors are we, have we, how is the coloring changing uh, over the facade, and um, and then the program calculated uh, exactly how each sheet would look like um, in order to make the best uh, possible pattern. And I should say, we, I also set, of course, how many different sheets. So here we had 90 different sheets. And then it also calculated how I'm going to mix these sheets, sheets up in order to get the best po possible pattern. And this is an example of the finished gradient then. Uh, and there was a quite intricate algorithm also for ca calculating the optimal sheets like how what is the best spreading of the different colors in each sheet in order to um, get the best possible overall pattern so that we want the thing that we don't want here is that we don't want to see any repetitions of course we don't it shouldn't look like there's lots of different there's lots of the same type of sheet but the, it should mix them up so uh, we don't we can't see any repetition. Uh, the interesting thing here is that I, I could actually, as I said before, I could set what colors I wanted here. This was the ordinary colors, uh, which we used in the end also, because it's an iconic building in Malmö and we, we weren't allowed to, to do any big changes. Um, and this is like where I only put in, um, a whole column of elements. But what I did is actually that I changed the colors to rainbow colors instead. Uh, instead of uh, having a blue gradient, I changed um, to rainbow colors. And if I'm looking at one, one of the uh, elements here of all these, I, I could generate, when the program was done, I could generate 
1,700 new drawings with different colors um, in just a few minutes. And this is done when it's changing from yellow, orange to, to green. And if we're looking at the whole facade, um, it would look like this. So these are all the elements of one facade put into one image. Uh, and this is the, uh, the good thing about computational design. And when, you, when you've done a program, uh, you can easily do another version very quickly and uh, get a totally different, different design. So um, that was actually my last slide. And um, yeah, I've given you an overview of computational design how it is to work as a computational designer in London and in Malmo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, um, because I can see everyone, I'm, I'm going to um, see if anyone wants to kick off with a question. The, uh, the airport made me think rather of, of some of the things we were shown when I was a student by um, Peter Cook of Archigram that just seemed mm. like cartoon, um, <laughs> not exactly nonsense, but pie in the sky. Um, <laughs> whereas here, here, here you were doing it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, um, I mean, it can seem quite uh, sci-fi, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, it, it's quite sci-fi actually, or quite uh, strange to see the, movies uh, like uh, drone movies done of, of the construction site how far it come because then you only see those funnels those uh, like mushrooms uh, looking funnels sticking up uh, and nothing more uh, but it, it it's sad that it was stopped because it would be amazing to to walk around in that structure i can see that um, uh, charlie has now got his camera um, on so hello hello charlie who spoke, who spoke to us uh, just over a month ago, uh, just over a year ago. That's right. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, thanks so much for your presentation. It's really fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I, had, uh, I had lots of questions, but I guess the first one I was most kind of curious about was your um, digital fabrication research. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was interested because I've seen that in the last two years, a lot of well publicized uses of uh, concrete extrusion mm. in kind of showcased architectural projects um, yeah. or clay or straw mm. and clay um, and these kind of paste materials right mm. and I just wondered whether you you know wh where where your research sort of where you where, what point you looked into that or yeah or so on. We actually, uh, we're looking into that also, actually. We haven't come that far, um, um, but we're, we've been starting looking at concrete uh, 3D printing. Uh, actually, if you, I can go back to a slide there, let's see. Um, if you look at this one, there's actually a, a string of uh, um, yeah. mortar here, and that's, that's done by, I can't really see it here, but when this head uh, rotates, there's, there's a pump. There, there, you see a tube going here, and that's pumping out um, wow. um, this um, uh, mortar here. So, and that's actually uh, very similar to, to 3D printing with concrete. We're just putting mm -hmm. out mortar instead. So we're gonna do experiments with this, just working with only the, the concrete also. We have a um, collaboration with uh, a cement factory in, in, um, um, in Sweden and yeah. I'm looking at this, so that's... Yeah, it would be amazing to include the mortar as part of the pattern, you know? Mm, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's, it, we are, we're really thinking about that now, how we're going to treat the mortar, because as you see here, it's very hard to try and uh, like keep the mortar hidden. Uh, so it, it, if you were rotating the stones like this, the, the mortar will 
come out um, in areas, but maybe this is maybe this is okay. Maybe this is something that we should design with instead also. Yeah. Um, and what we've th been thinking about also is to actually combine um, uh, this kind of masonry, robotic masonry with 3D printing. I mean, having a structure with it, which is additive in its construction in different scales, like you're um, working with additive construction with this big building box, but then also additive construction with the 3D printing. It would be quite interesting to see, build, build a structure which are, which is, um, it has bricks where, where there's logic to have bricks and it has 3D printed parts, mm. on, only the concrete where, where there's some logic in that. And I think what would be really fascinating about that is you'd be able to take advantage of gravity's effect on any paste mm. uh, material, you know? Yeah. I know I've, I've kind of like enjoyed the way that, you know, a very, uh, what do you call it, a kind of lateral design in a 3D modeling program mm -hmm. is transformed into something fairly organic and yeah, yeah, yeah. HR Geiger like just by the, mm. the fact of gravity acting on the line of the clay and, and it falling and slipping and, and so yeah. on. Yeah, you know, we're but... actually, uh, I mean, another research uh, project also with um, Schalmers Institute of Technology in Gothenburg, and then they're looking at um, uh, 3D printing with cellulose material, oh, and, wow. uh, yeah. and they also get the same kind of um, effects there, where which is that what they're designing in the, the, the perfect design in, in the computer is very far from what they're get, getting in the, in the finished product. Uh, there's, mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's also effect, yeah, the effects of gravity makes uh, different things happen, which is uh, quite interesting in, in many ways. Yeah, especially um, if you've got a material that can handle it, you know, that can... Yeah. Has has the, the the spectrum of strength and property mm. that can can uh, yeah can handle a bit of oh, changes or environmental yeah. changes I suppose aren't they? And I, I'm quite interesting actually in seeing if we could do something with the cellulose 3D printing together with the robotic masonry. It would be an interesting mix to have this light a wooden structure 3D printed wooden structures. Uh, together with the, the more like uh, maybe bricks in the foundation of, of the structure we're building. Mm. Wow. Good, fascinating stuff though. What fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's lots of fun uh, working with this. It's kind of, uh, it's a playground. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Goldsmith's hand up. Yeah, um, that was a very interesting lecture indeed. It's fascinating. No, thank you. And it makes me wonder and worry actually that somebody would try to build a construct something without at least having thought through very carefully what the implications were both in terms of the building itself and what happens to the people inside it but also what happens to people outside it and indeed the bigger environment of the city mm. and one good example of that of course is 20 Fenchurch Street which we know as the walkie-talkie which you'll know very oh, well yeah. in the center of London mm. and um Raphael uh, Vignoli, I think his name was, was an Uruguayan uh, architect, uh, built a very unusual, iconic building, which everybody actually enjoys looking at. Well, I do anyway. And unfortunately, in the summer of 2013, one of its two major unintended consequences became apparent when it started to superheat objects mm -hmm. on East Cheap, which lies just to the south of that building because it's shaped like a parabola and therefore concentrates the sun's rays. Yeah. Not, not perhaps surprising. I think we've known about mirrors and concentrating the sun's rays for a bit longer than that. But um, not only that, but it also apparently sets in train a number of unexpected consequences for wind. So when wind gets going, you can get mm. some quite, quite severe, um, well, not mini hurricanes or tornadoes down at p pavement level. So you, mm. you do wonder if people build buildings that look fantastic, drop dead gorgeous, as it were, whether they've really thought through all of this. And if they perhaps did what you did, 
they mm. would um, not end up with a building that looks great that rapidly has to be altered. I don't know whether you think that's the case. Yeah, uh, very interesting points. Uh, when it comes to um, the first pro uh, problem you were talking about there, um, with the uh, sun reflection and and the glare, uh, as we call it, when when uh, when people are actually uh, bl blinded by the uh, by the sun rays. Yeah, uh, I I was uh, working on a uh, a new skyscraper in. Um, in San Francisco when I was at Postas uh, for a little while and that um, that was supposed to be built by a highly reflective material yeah. so there there I, I had to um, simulate how what was the risk of being blinded by the sun when you were driving on mm. the streets uh, mm. around uh, around the building so and try and, and what you need to do then of course is to either change the shape of of, um, of the parts of the building or or make a less reflective material in, the, in yeah. those areas which is uh, is at risk of blinding people that that happened also in um, los angeles for uh, you, maybe you know you know the bilbao uh, yes. guggenheim yeah. And yeah, there's a Walt yeah. Disney concert hall in Los Angeles, yeah. which is yeah. quite similar. And that was that has these concave areas, which actually work as lenses, just like um, yeah, shoot, then shooting rays onto the of sun onto the <laughs> highways, blinding people. So they had to change the facade there and make it less reflective. Yeah, it's just, uh, just and when it comes come, when it comes to the wind, uh, that's something that's uh, very much uh, something talked about uh, in in architecture firms, of course. Um, uh, actually, the building. One bad example of uh, uh, of that is actually the building next to Foster's, which is designed by Foster's also in in Battersea. I, ah. I I felt that yeah, it's just by the Royal Academy there. I think uh, that. Um, the, the area around that, uh, like uh, um, cashew cashew nut shaped building, that's uh, next next to Foster's. That's that's really bad for 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 wind. And um, so, if they had done some good wind wind simulation there, they they would probably not have shaped the building like that. But the problem with wind simulation is that it's very very complex. It yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it demands because you need to find um, th there's so small differences in in the computation that makes you um, you you could miss the, the, the yeah like the butterfly effect that uh, that creates the uh, the turbulence. So if you if you just if your your resolution in your com computation is is not um if the resolution isn't high enough you you uh, risk of missing this t turbulence and therefore yeah. it's very computationally heavy so you can't you can't really do it with a normal computer you need a, a cloud computing or super yeah yeah i get that that's really interesting thank you very very much great thanks if, if maybe we've got another question Um, Richard Bates, Royal College of Art. Uh, hi, that's a really interesting talk. What I'd be oh, quite interested to, to, to get your thoughts on is we, you, you're talking quite a lot about sort of new developments, new builds. Oh. What about where you're much more restricted? How would you apply some of the modelling to um, existing buildings and retroactive um, refurbishments? You know, for example, mm. um, an art college. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think what I'm what I'm thinking about first when you, you said this was that uh, now when we're looking at the robotic uh, masonry and, and building, um, we've actually been thinking about that. What we could do with this construction technique is 
uh, to build with um, not perfect bricks, but building with uh, reused materials. So you could actually, um, and an idea that I have is, what if um, we we have a stack of uh, reused material? It could be like big big sheets of um, bricks or um, smaller parts, like ma maybe partly destroyed bricks. Like, uh, um, could we make a design tool that could actually make help us design with with the, these parts that we got uh, because normally now we we have perfect um, we're designing with the uh, idea that we have uh, we will fabricate new building parts and we will just um, build with these perfect uh, perfectly fabricated building parts but if we were using something we maybe not have we will not have like um, yeah, we need to see what material do we have and what can we build with that. It's a different, bit different of what you're talking about. But uh, if I'm, if I'm, if we're talking more about refurbishment, I think that um, we could all the analysis that we're doing, like all the daylight analysis and, and all um, the analysis of how how well a building is performing. That's still relevant when you're refurbishing. So it could help you uh, redesign a building um, uh, in a better way, like if thinking, thinking very carefully about um, the daylighting and maybe the wind. And so when, when you're refurbishing. Uh, so I think that uh, the way we're using data and analysis for a new build would be also um, very well suited for, for refurbishment, actually. Oh, and another thing, one thing that we were looking at actually at Foster's was that uh, we were looking at how the building was used inside and how, how should we plan, uh, for example, an office in order to make it as efficient as possible. That is how um, to make the like connectivity within the building as efficient as possible. Uh, and that that could be something that you could use for a refurbishment also because you maybe you have one use for the building right now. Maybe it's um, a school or something, but you want to remake it into uh, apartments or an office building. Then then you could be helped by um, computational design tools in order to make the most efficient uh, new plan for that. That's what I'm thinking of right now. Um, I know that you're um, a life member of the um, uh, uh, Society of Swedish Engineers, and I'm just wondering if I, uh, from from the Anglo-Swedish side, um, co-hosts here, um, could we um, offer you a, a 2022 complimentary membership as a, as a, a way of being able to keep in touch with you? Mm, that would be very nice. I would be honoured. Oh, good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Henry. Very nice, as usual, very good speech. Thank you. So see you soon in London, I hope. Yeah, yeah, it would be very nice. I hope I, it's possible to, to travel soon again. Yeah, look forward. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And, and we all look forward to get, getting together in person before too yeah. long. Yeah. So um, thank you, and, and let's all stay in touch, and, and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you very much. Very, very Thank good. you. Take care.